Support for this episode is provided by Pennsylvania College of Art and Design and listeners like you. Welcome to the Linecast. I'm David Moulton. On this episode, I sat down with Shane Graybill of Cult Choir. During the first half of the show, we talked with Shane a little bit about how he creates the melodies and lyrics for his music. It's kind of nice because since I was never taught necessarily how the correct way of writing is, I can kind of just do whatever I feel like doing or whatever um, inspires me to write. And we talked with Shane about what goes through his mind when collecting songs for an album. I kind of made it so that all the tracks almost run into each other, like it just flows and one song will just flow into the next song and then that'll flow into the next song, just because I like when artists do that. It almost makes it seem like just one long progressive song, which is kind of cool, which is like a lot of, with just a lot of parts. Enjoy the conversation. Well, Shane, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks again for having me. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to talk about your musical endeavor called Cult Choir. Uh, let's just start off first and talk about you and music. And how, how did you kind of get into it? Um, it kind of, I never even like considered doing music when I was uh, growing up, like in high school and stuff. I always liked to sing, but I never actually like got into it or took it seriously. And um, a good friend of mine, Tony Bizazz, actually, when I was in high school, just told me to sing one day while we were in art class. And he said that he liked it. And I guess I respected him as like one of the, um, best local artists around that I knew at the time. And ever since then, I just kind of always have been making music with uh, a lot of different people. And then after high school, I dove a little bit more into it, started Grim Wilderness. And after that broke up, started a little bit more mm -hmm. tight knit of a project called Burial Grounds. And that just ended recently. So now I'm going full in on Cold Choir and my solo project. Hmm. What would you say is the evolution of your style over this period of time from from being in two bands and then now being on your own? Um, well, with Grim Wilderness, I was just the front man. So that kind of helped me more so um, come out as a performer and be a little bit more um, confident with my singing because I got to focus just on that. And I didn't actually know how to play any instruments when I was in Grim Wilderness. And now, and, or, and then when we started Burial Grounds, I took on playing the bass. Obviously, very simple stuff because I literally just like picked up bass and decided that I was going to play it for that band. And so then I had to sing and play bass, which was definitely a challenge. And um, basically, when Burial Grounds was uh, coming down to an end, kind of, I was, started taking guitar lessons and. Um, also bought a drum set, uh, have a keyboard. So I was kind of just messing around with all those different instruments and, uh, started recording my first solo album while Burial Grounds was still going on, kind of like when I had downtime and, um, yeah, I guess, I guess, uh, what about musically the style wise? How did that, how did that change? Style-wise, Grim Wilderness and Burial Grounds, I guess, not that they sounded completely the same, but they both definitely had a very 60s um, psychedelic garage rock influence. And though I'm still um, influenced by that kind of music, um, I also brought in styles of bands like Sonic Youth and Beck from the 90s. Um, I definitely was really into the White Stripes, as I still am and always will be. Diff just different ways of singing, um, and you can kind of tell with the first album that it's very eclectic all over the place. Um, you'll hear stuff that has like some chill wave influences from like electronic artists now. You'll have some stuff that's kind of off the wall, just me like kind of messing around, doing whatever I want. Also some even older stuff, maybe like 50s, which even more so now is being one of my biggest influences. I'm listening to a lot of Elvis and a lot of the 50s like doo-wop artists and kind of taking that old style and making it more of like making it more modern like my own modern take on it I guess hmm. so <clears throat> I want to step into the psychedelic part you that that word gets thrown around and when I think of yeah. psychedelic I think of like you know 
some of the '60s stuff yeah. that was that was out. What does it mean to you, and how would how would you say that uh, music lives out that description? No, I mean you're definitely right. It does get thrown around a lot. Like you can say all kinds of genres and all kinds of sounds are psychedelic. It's pretty vague. Um, I guess with me, it just means it almost just like when you're listening to the music, it almost just has not that. Not that it, psychedelic has to be put together with like drug use or being you know intoxicated of with some kind of substance, but to me it almost means like the music sounds like you're on that like you're on a drug or like the music is on a drug. Um, it's just like I try and take music and warp it and warp the sounds I'm making so that they don't necessarily sound pleasant, but they still sound good if that makes sense. Okay. All right. Kind of like um, a tone might not necessarily end before it's renewed kind of a thing. It just kind of feels, kind of keep, continues to flow. Yeah. Um, I definitely like to use like a lot of reverb, some echo, some delay, uh, distortion. So I guess kind of when you just kind of when you're just messing with a lot of different sounds uh, and you're not really going for a real clean pop sound, things tend to sound a little bit more psychedelic a lot of the times what about writing um not you know having a large musical background and then kind of coming into it yeah how how, how did you teach yourself to write music <laughs> i wouldn't necessarily say that i can write music uh i would say that a lot of times my writing style starts with me just being down at the studio by myself um I have a studio right near my house in Denver, and it's definitely a place where I feel most um, most comfortable, I guess. And I can kind of just be in my own head and just kind of experiment with a lot of different uh, different instruments because I have a bass, a drum set, synthesizer, guitar down there. I also have a recording. Um, I also have my iPad down there and a recording microphone. So it's kind of nice because I can just, you know, maybe it starts with a drum beat, maybe it starts with a bass line, maybe it starts with a guitar line, but I definitely don't have a one, like one way that I write every single song. Sometimes it starts with a melody that comes into my head when I'm just driving in the car and I'll build music around that melody. Um, but it's kind of nice because since I was never taught necessarily how the correct way of writing is, I can kind of just do whatever I feel like doing or whatever um, inspires me to write. But um, right now with this new, with a lot of the new tracks I'm working on, um, it it's definitely coming from the 50s side of things. Like I was saying earlier, I just I'm listening to a lot of 50s style stuff. And some of that, whatever stuff just like fits, like will just hold on to me. I'll just kind of run with it and try and make it my own, whatever aspects I like. What What about lyrically? Because you talked about a, a lot about how you, you kind of come up with the music. Does, does the music come first and then the lyrics or? Not always. Um, sometimes, you know, I'll just be driving. It's mainly, I would say more so than melody or more so than the lyrics would be the melody comes first. Um, so sometimes the music does come first, uh, but I would say m probably more so now it's a lot of melody. Like I'll get like a melody that I like, I'll be like humming in my car, like, dun, 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 and I'll be like, oh, I kind of like that melody. And the nice thing about uh, electronic, like electronics uh, evolving over the past couple of years is most of your cell phones have a recorder on it. So, you know, I'll be in the car, it's probably not the safest thing, but I'll pull out my <laughs> recorder on the, phone, on the phone and just record it and take it back to the studio and maybe work on it later. You'd be one of the few people we see singing down the road that's actually yeah. you know, singing something for real, <laughs> yeah. not just to the radio. Not always, though. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, because we, we we keep coming back to the '50s as one of your inspirations. What what things inspired you the beginning? And, and I said you said you come to the '50s, and who are the people specifically that are that are inspiring you now? Um, well, I'm listening to a lot of uh, Elvis, more so like the gospel side of Elvis. And it's not that just the '50s are inspiring me. And I wouldn't say it's specific artists. I would say it's specific genres, like. I'll try and look up a lot of uh, doo-wop 
and you know I can't even name a duo like a specific duo artist that I like, but um, I can get like some mixes on the internet and whatnot of different uh, duo artists just playing their one hit wonders or whatever. And I don't know, I just I just dig the style, and it just seems like. It just seems like not a lot of people are like you know doing maybe doo wop, and I kind of think it's still. <laughs> I still, I mean, I still think it's enjoyable to listen to and feel like well, if that's the kind of stuff I like listening to, then I might as well just make it. Why not? <laughs> that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. So I, I would say that that your style of music necessarily isn't today is mainstream no not at all (laughs) (laughs) where do you find uh, an audience for this type of music it is definitely tough um especially in this area because i mean not that not to take anything away but it just seems like pop punk and metal and the uh, singer songwriter thing is still pretty prominent in this area pretty much the main things people like to listen to and go out to clubs and venues and listen to. Um, this The kind of music I'm making, I think, definitely has an audience. I think that I fit in with a lot of the artists I like listening to um, from nowadays. And, you know, those kind of artists sell out shows all the time, like in bigger cities like Philadelphia and, um, you know, L.A. and San Francisco and the, like, more liberal cities. Um, that, you know, are into, you know, art rock and, uh, electronica, not the, uh, Skrillex electronica, but, uh, (laughs) you know, actual good electronica, no offense, (laughs) but, um, um, you know, I'm just hoping that if I keep at it and, um, you know, keep sending my music out to, there's a few radio stations, like there's a... There's an AM radio station in Michigan I got to play my music. So, I mean, if I figure if I just keep sending it out, keep slowly building a fan base that eventually it'll, you know, maybe get me some sort of small record deal or something like that and can help. And from there, it can help me broaden my fans and my listening ears. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned a record deal, and one of the things that's very popular these days is just self-publishing. Yeah. Do you, do you feel the music industry is growing away from record deals, or is that still going to be the mainstay? Um, when I say record deal, I'm obviously not looking at a record deal where I'm going out and buying a Lambo right away, something like that. Yeah. Um, it's It would kind of just be, you know, they would maybe help me with the funds to get um, production of CDs, maybe get promotion of shows, maybe get some bigger venues to help me get booked under artists who are going to draw a crowd, getting my name more out there, right. smaller stuff like that. I do feel for um, indie rock and the kind of music I'm into and try and make is definitely going away from the record deals. Uh, I mean, there's artists who are huge. I mean, I still think Pearl Jam is is self distributing their their work, and I mean, you look at guys like Jack White, who now own their own record label because they were like unsigned, and they're just kind of renegades. And I mean, it's cool, but I don't necessarily know if I don't know if uh, it's easy for all artists to do that to go against the record labels. I mean, if there's a record label that wants to help me out, I'm definitely going to take the help, no doubt about that. But for right now, I'm I'm definitely (laughs) distributing it on my own. (laughs) Well, before we head to break, we're going to listen to your song, Turn Out the Lights. And uh, I know this has some of your 50s influence in it. Can can you explain some of the inspiration behind the lyrics and the music? Um, the the lyrics actually, it was one of those things. It was definitely one of those songs where the melody came first, and um, the lyrics I had kind of in the back of my mind even while I was in the grim wilderness like two three years ago. And it's just one of those things I've always had in my mind that I never really um, pursued like making and the one the one night i was just listening to some 50s music and i was like man that song that was in the back of my head like turn out the lights i think would um go over really well with like a 50s style um sound so i just kind of went into the studio and it honestly just like it just happened kind of you know it happened real easily uh 
I added, I from listening to the 50s music, I was able to add some backing vocals that I think are really nice, really simple, just like sha-la-la. And everything is very simple. The bass line is very simple. The guitar is very simple. And it kind of just, I think that's why it's so easy to listen to and enjoyable because everything's so simple. It's just, you hear it right away and you feel like it's one of those, you know, classic songs that you've heard before. Well, here's Turn Out the Lights by Cult Choir. Cinema to find out what everyone's been talking about. Excuse me, why do you choose Penn Cinema? I like the seats. They're really comfy. <laughs> They're a lot nicer than most other places. Even my house. <laughs> oh, well, this place is great. I mean, it's popcorn. We got some. Uh, we got a slushy machine over there. Found some, we got three clocks. Three clocks for the Lidditz, the Lancaster, and the effort of time, just in case you know you don't know what time it is in your area. That's why I love this place. They 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 think about everybody. You know, very friendly. Has a nicer environment. It's clean and comfortable. It feels independent. You know, like it doesn't feel like part of a system. Like it feels like as big as it is and as polished as it is that it feels independent, you know? Bigger screen, better quality. So it's really close. It's very clean. We come here all the time. What do you like about Penn Cinema? The seats are my favorite thing. Very comfortable. On the rump. (laughs) 3D IMAX, the whole shebang. It has a down-home feel, and we love the atmosphere that Penn has created. He really tries to take into account what people want in a theater. It's really clean, and the seats are really comfy. (laughs) Yeah, I like the seats. It's the best movie theater to come to. Well, you've heard what they have to say. Now come see for yourself. Check out Penn Cinema for first-class movies in a first-rate theater. Located at 541 Airport Road in Lidditz, PA. And we're back on the line cast with Shane Grabo. Shane, when we went to break, we were talking about uh, your inspirations and, and the music industry and stuff. Now let's talk about... Uh, what goes into making your albums? When you sit down, how many songs do you have in mind, and what kind of length are you looking for? Um, well, I think it has to do with the fact that I have sort of music ADD. Like, there's longer songs. Like, I love Echoes by Pink Floyd. There's definitely some longer songs that I'm into. But a lot of the times, if I'm listening to songs on my iPod or a CD, I definitely will listen to a song for like a minute and a half, two minutes, and if it's longer than that, I'll usually go to the next song because I basically got like the gist of that song. Unless there's like this incredible ending that just builds up that I need to listen to. Oh, sorry. But um, I would say for me, usually my songs are usually like two minutes, two to three minutes, just because I like writing quick, catchy, 
usually upbeat songs, but I'm getting into some like slower, more ballad, gospel influence um, stuff on this next album as well. Um, but yeah, I guess just because I like to listen to songs that are shorter, that's just the kind of music I make. So when making shorter songs, do you put more on an album? Like how many are you looking Yeah, my last album was about 37 minutes long, which I guess is, you know, right around average for an album length. Um, but there were 20 songs on it. Wow. <laughs> um, another thing is I did, I did make a lot of shorter songs on the last album. And when I took it to uh, John Levasseur at uh, Sound Design Studios um, to kind of like master it and put the album together... Um, I put, I kind of made it so that all the tracks almost run in to each other. Like it just flows in one song will just flow into the next song and then that'll flow into the next song. Just cause I like when artists do that. It almost makes it seem like just one long progressive song, hmm. which is kind of cool, which is like a lot of, with just a lot of parts. Um, so I definitely try and think of that when I'm putting an album together. I like to listen to every single song, um, down the line and then try and think of how I can maybe make it so that those songs sound good back to back. I don't like it to just be like song, song, song. I like it to be like end of the song is going on while the beginning of the next song is pretty much happening. So what would you say is the theme from the first album? There is definitely no theme. Um, it's all over the place. Uh, there's, a lot of songs that have to do with, I think, past um, substance abuse and really crappy relationships. And now with this new one, the first, first like probably six or seven songs that I wrote, I kind of had in mind doing like a real strong 50s sound to it, but in a post-apocalyptic kind of setting. Like I almost had like a story going on, kind of about a guy and a girl like just facing like the end of the world and they don't know what's going to happen. And I'm basically with these songs, it's kind of about me trying to be the strong one as I feel like I probably would try and be if it's the end of the world. I'm with a girl. Um, and it's kind of me almost lying to her, telling her everything's going to be all right when I'm suffering just as bad as she is. And I'm just as scared and worried. And I don't know, it just seemed like a cool idea, but I think that I might just put, those songs in the beginning of the album or at the end of the album and i w like because i was going to do an ep but i think i'm just going to make it a full album and maybe maybe have like like two or three different kind of stories and um kind of make that obvious on the album like maybe write it in the credits or whatever that not in the credits, but on the back that the first seven songs are about this and the next, you know, six songs are about this and then the rest of the songs are about something else and just make almost like a short trilogy on the album, if right. that makes sense. <laughs> That's an interesting way to, to kind of lay it out. With, with that kind of setup, how would you choose a title track or a title for, for an album like that? Ugh. Good, good question. Sometimes I like just being completely random and not having a reason for why I do stuff. <laughs> um, the last album I called Summer Sacrifice, and I like that because um, – what is it called when you put two, two words back-to-back -back that have the same starting letter? Is that alliteration? Uh, probably. I, th I, think <laughs> I, it's, I think it's alliteration. I'm not positive. I'm, I wasn't the best English student, but I, I kind of like when people – like when people have like the name, like, you know, like – um, Dan Donaldson or something. When they have, it just like makes it sound like a like a familiar thing. So Colt Choir, I like that because it starts with both both have C's, so it kind of just like rolls off your tongue real easy. And so I did the same thing with Summer Sacrifice, and I call it call it that because I knew I wanted the album to come out in the summer. And I, when I was trying to get the album together. I knew that I was spending too much time at the bar, too much time hanging out with my friends and girls, and I just had to kind of sacrifice my time and get the album done because I knew I wanted to have it done in the summer. Hmm. <clears throat> let's let's discuss the name Cult Choir. What was the inspiration behind that, and uh, why not just use your own name when it's a solo project? Um, well, to be honest with you, I kind of find it lame when people use their first name as just like their 
uh, project. No, I mean, not lame. If they're if their name's cool or if they just like want to go by their name, that's fine. That's like how they want to do it. So it's whatever. But I, a lot of the music I listen to, such as um, Neon Indian. I'm um, trying to think of some other people. Uh, Dirty Beaches, Zoo Kid. They're all one person acts or projects, but they have a moniker that they go by as a stage name. And I don't know. I don't think I have a bad name or anything, but I thought Cole Choir was a lot cooler. And I, for some reason, just knew I wanted to use the name, use the word Colt in my name. And uh, I had a couple ideas like Colt Gospel, Colt, um, like Colt Teaching. I, had, I couldn't really come up with a name that just stuck that I liked. And my good friend, Brett Keller, actually came up with the word, the name Colt Choir when me and it was back in Grim Wilderness era when me and him were playing like as a side thing together. Um, and I've really liked the name and I just asked him if I could like roll with it as my solo project when he moved away and he said he didn't care at all. So just kind of kept with it. Hmm. Cool. We're going to go ahead and play another one of your songs <laughs> called something's there. And just like before I, I'd, I'd really like to hear what your inspiration was lyrically and musically for this. This one had a pretty cool, uh, influence actually i was down at the studio by myself like normal and um it, the studio is actually the basement of one of my dad's old business buildings um used as storage before and when i started getting into music he just said i could use it and everyone that's down there swears they can they always are just hearing like the door open and close footsteps stuff like moving and just like just noises all the time and you know, sometimes I'll be down there recording and I'll hear something and I'll think some one of my friends knocking on the door or someone's walking in or someone moves something and I'll go check and nothing's there. But the one time I was recording, it was actually during the week of Halloween. So I think the spirits were a little bit more uh, rambunctious than normal. And um, I was recording and I swear I heard the door like open and slam, looked out, nothing was there there. But um, it kind of influenced me to just write kind of a more spooky song, um, especially during this, especially because it was the spirit of Halloween. So I kind of tried to write one, uh, you know, a, a spooky but old school spooky song. And I got a little bit of influence from those old like recordings that you could buy. I don't know if you remember, like you can buy like CDs that are just recordings of like scary stuff. But yeah, me and my yeah. friends, when we were really, really young, we used to listen to them. And I don't know why I just, <laughs> I just thought of them and kind of put some background vocals and noises into the song, just kind of to do that kind of thing. Well, here's something's there by Colt choir. Well, Shane, I want to thank you for coming on the show and, and joining us. Thank you for having me. If people want to learn more about Cult Choir and, and hear some of your music, how can they do that? Well, um, you can check me out on Facebook, as with you can probably do with anyone. <laughs> um, I also have a Bandcamp site. You know, I'm, all, I'm open to emails at thegrimwilderness.com. Always looking to collaborate, always looking to play out wherever I can. Great. Well, thanks once again. Thank you. We hope you've been enjoying the Lancast. 
This episode was produced by myself, David Moulton, with show notes by Keith and Lawrence Lesser. All pertinent links to this episode can be found in the show notes at thelancast.com. If you specifically like this episode, we ask that you consider making a donation. Every little bit helps. Even a dollar a show can keep us going. If you'd like to help support us, you can do so by going to thelancast.com slash donate. And don't forget to subscribe in iTunes and tell a friend about the show. So, for the Linecast, I'm David Moulton. And I'm Keith Slesser. Asking, are you in the cast? Are you in the cast?